Welcome to another moment in the Word. Is your marriage a blessing? A blessing to you? Do you find enjoyment in it? Or has it been a drudgery? Has it been a real challenge to you? Have you found it difficult? In fact, are you asking yourself, maybe I shouldn't have married? Well, actually, that's the very question that the disciples are asking Jesus after this discussion that he's had about marriage. And the question that the Pharisees had raised about the basis for divorce. Well, here's what Jesus now says and what the disciples say. We start first with the disciples. We're in Matthew, we're in chapter 19, and we're looking at verses 10 to 12. And his disciples say unto him, In the case of marriage, if this be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. But he, Jesus, said unto them, his disciples, all men cannot receive this saying, except they to whom it is given. For there are some who are eunuchs who were born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdoms of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. All right, this is a really interesting passage. I think you'll agree with me, and not an easy passage to understand. I think you'll agree with me there, too. But it's interesting in the context of what Jesus is saying. Jesus' answer to the Pharisees has been rather consistent. He says, from the beginning, it wasn't so. He always takes them back to Genesis. He always reminds what the purpose of wedding is, that it is the very union that a person has with another person, a man and a woman. And that is symbolic not only of the Trinity, but also of the relationship that Israel had with Yahweh, the relationship that Christ has with with the church. And now the disciples listening to Jesus, they're realizing that Jesus is basically saying there is no divorce. And therefore, they're really now put off. And they're asking, and his disciples, and it's plural, they say, and the implication from the, the text, from the, the, uh, the, the, the tense of the verb, is that they're continuing to talk to one another. And remember now, it's in 1 Corinthians, and in chapter 9, verse 5, all of these disciples, well, most of them at least, are married. So this is really personal. And maybe it's personal to you as you're listening because you're married. And so they say, after listening to Jesus, in this case, in the case of what they have just heard, and that word case is the same word that was translated in verse 3 and 5 as cause. In other words, this being the basis for a divorce and Jesus, you're saying that is not the case? If that be the case, they say it, of a man, it is with a woman, it is better not to marry. Now, they're not justifying asceticism or celibacy and saying that that's what they understand Jesus saying. They're just understanding that what the rabbis have been teaching about the Torah now they realize they can't go there. And Jesus is making it very, very difficult. And so they say, it's not good to marry. Now that word good is also an interesting word because it has the idea of receiving as a receptacle and something that is advantageous, something that is to their um, benefit. And they're looking and they're saying, you know, it's not good for us to marry. It's not to our advantage to marry. Well, that's where Jesus now is going to respond. And maybe you're going into a marriage and you're saying, I'm marrying him because he makes me happy, because he loves me, before he causes me to bring great joy in, and I become more than I am uh, because of him or her. But that really isn't what marriage is about. Jesus said in the very beginning that the purpose of marriage is actually to glorify God. And through that marriage, we procreate. We, with God, we create little 
persons who have a soul, who are made in the image of God. And it's really a blessing to join God in the creation of others. But they're not looking at others. They're not looking at their children. They're not even looking at their spouse. They're saying it's not good for us. It's not to our advantage. And that is hard to accept, isn't it? But if you go into marriage and you say, you know, my desire is to love my spouse, that it is more important that I give to them than I receive, then everything changes. And that's what our Lord, I think, is getting at. Notice how he responds. Verse 11, and he said unto them, um, all men cannot receive this saying. What is this saying? What is Jesus referring to? Well, it's, it's real interesting. It's not referring to the disciples saying, it's referring back to his saying. His saying is talking about God's purpose for marriage, that his purpose is to show unity. His purpose is to show love, what real love is. His purpose is to show the Trinity itself. His purpose is to show the relationship that sinful men redeemed by the blood can have with their God. Isn't that incredible? And so consequently, he says, not everybody can accept this saying. Now, it's really interesting to me also that this passage is only found in Matthew's gospel. It's not found in Mark. It's not found in Luke. And it's not found in John. Now, why is that? Because of the purpose to which Matthew has written. Remember that Matthew is writing about the kingdom and about the king and that there is a unique relationship you have with Messiah, that you are in Christ. There is a union, there's a relationship there. And Matthew may also be writing it because he is married, and it's very personal. And I pray as you're looking at this and meditating with me on this passage that you see it not just as a difficult passage to understand, but instead as a very intimate and personal relationship you have with your God, your creator, your redeemer, your Messiah, and the Savior and Lord of your life. And so consequently, he says, unto whom it is given. They're the only ones that can receive. How is it given? It's given by the Holy Spirit. You and I cannot receive the things of God except he give it to us. And he gives it to us through his word, his word that is written, his word that became flesh, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, who died on the cross for you. And then finally, through his Holy Spirit, you receive the things of God because God has given it to you. And then we find four, and now Jesus describes eunuchs. Now this goes back to Matthew is writing about a kingdom. There were eunuchs in the kingdom. A eunuch is one who doesn't have the capacity to have a relationship with the opposite sex, a male that can't have a relationship with a female sexually. And he says that there are some, and there's three kinds of eunuchs, some that were born that way. They were impotent. They could not have a relationship with a woman. And in order to be married in a Jewish ceremony, you had to consummate the wedding, which means they had to have the capacity then to have intercourse. Then there are some eunuchs who are made eunuchs by men. And that is, it was not uncommon in the ancient world, it isn't uncommon today, that many compromise their government and those they serve by having affairs and sexual relationships with other countries or with their enemies. And so consequently, there are some that are eunuchs and they serve only the king, only the Caesar, only the, the ruler of that nation by being eunuchs so that they are now committed only to serving that government. And then Jesus says, but there are also some who are made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom. Now, that is where they may, by choice, have chosen celibacy where they have said, I am not going to have sex with a, the, a woman because I want to serve God. And it's talking about the kingdom. 
Jesus is saying that there are those options, but now what if you are married? And what if you do have a relationship, and I pray you do with your spouse? Well, if that be the case, that doesn't mean that you're marginalized and you are a second-class citizen or that you have some some spiritual uh, lower level than those who are uh, celibate. No, Jesus is not saying that your relationship with the kingdom is determined by whether or not you have sex. It's determined by your allegiance with the king. That's what it's about. And so he says there are those who have various ways in which they see that their relationship with themselves, the world, and with even their spouse to then be what now is going to advance the kingdom. And Jesus then concludes by saying, for the kingdom of heaven's sake. That's what this is all about. So what is the purpose of your marriage? Does your marriage, or if you're single, does your life then emulate the kingdom of heaven? Whatever you do, word or deed, Paul says in Colossians, do all to the glory of God. That's the purpose. And then he goes on to say that you're doing it for the kingdom of heaven's sake. That then is what is good. That takes us back to verse 10. The disciples are thinking, what's good or advantageous to me? Jesus is responding to that. And he's saying it's not about what's good for you. It's what's good for the kingdom. Because if it's truly good for the kingdom of heaven, it is good for you. It is what is best for you. When you serve God, God blesses you. And you will be blessed even greater than if you ever thought about blessing yourself. That's where then Jesus concludes by saying, he that is able to receive it, let him receive it. And the receive what? Receive his saying. Receive what he is saying regarding the purpose of marriage. It is not to make you happy. Marriage is to make you holy. It is not about how you can find fulfillment in yourself. No, it's how you as an individual and your spouse together, your family together, then glorify God, and that advances the kingdom of heaven. Can you receive it? There is that word again, to be as a receptacle, accepting what it is that God has for you. And what he has for you is far greater than what you could ever, ever, ever give back to him. Let's pray. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the enjoyment we find in just opening it up and studying it. But also, Father, for the cleansing power, the the conviction that brings to us, the awareness. We don't think the way you think. We need your spirit and your word to guide us and to rethink and to transform our minds that we might be renewed and that we, Father, might truly glorify you. Now we pray for not only ourselves, we pray for our spouses, we pray for our children and our grandchildren, and we pray, Father, that you would bring in them that desire to love you with all their heart, soul, and might. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen.